live now. Who's uh, starting up? Is it? Uh... Yeah, I'm starting. Okay, we are live now. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have a very interesting session, uh, a debate on unique compartmental knee osteoarthritis. We have a we are going to have a hot debate between high tibial osteotomy for unique compartmental osteoarthritis and unicondylar arthroplasty. Professor Vladimir Martinik is going to talk on high tibial osteotomy, and Dr. Mohan Tadi is going to defend for UKA. Let me please introduce the faculty for today. Professor Martinik is specialist in orthopedics and trauma surgery, is head of department and joint of uh, orthopedics and joint center at Schoen Clinic, Bad Ebling, in Germany. His, uh, he had his training and uh, he has a lot of uh, clinical experience at University of California, San Francisco, Pacific Presbyterian Medical Center, Harvard Medical School, Boston, New England. And he had his clinical career in uh, University of Cologne, Technical University of Munich, Brewer's Cantonal Hospital in Basel. He also had his research fellowship in University of Pittsburgh, University of Rostock. He is currently chief physician in orthopedics at Hathorsen Badabling and Schoen Clinic Hathorsen. He is an active member of German Society of Orthopedics and Trauma Surgery, German speaking working group for arthroscopy, Society of Orthopedic Traumatological Sports Medicine, and ISACOS, and also honorary member of ZEC Society for Sports Traumatology and Arthroscopy. I thank you very much, Dr. Ma, for joining us for today's program and agreeing to share your knowledge on high tubule osteotomy. We have an expert faculty with us. That's Professor Andreas Imhoff. Thank you very much, Professor Andreas, for joining us today. Professor Andreas is Professor of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine at Technical University of Munich, Germany. He is Director and Chairman of Department of Orthopedics and sports medicine since 1996. He's an active member of German Society of Arthroscopy and Joint Surgery. He has edited 33 books and he has two, more than 265 journal publications. He's on the board of directors of German Society of Orthopedics, German Society of Orthopedics and Traumatology, and he's active member of ESACOS, Swiss Society of Orthopedics, ESSA, European Society of Surgery of Shoulder and Elbow, AOSSM, and German Society for Children and Elders. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to have you, Professor Andreas. Thank you for joining us. I kindly invite Dr. Srinivas to introduce Dr. Mohan Tadi and Dr. Ravi Kelko. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you, uh, Ceci, for that. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank Professor Martinek, Professor Imhoff, Dr. Tadi Mohan, and Ravi Chandra Kelkar for accepting to uh, participate in this. Uh, Dr. Tadi Mohan, uh, it's a pleasure to in introduce uh, Dr. Tadi and uh, uh, Kelkar. Both of them are good friends of mine. Uh, Dr. Tadi Mohan is a clinical professor at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences in Kochi, in Kerala. He works as a clinical professor. Um, and did his MBBS from uh, Jitma Pondicherry and post-graduation from uh, PGA Chandigarh. And he, he worked in the NHS in UK between uh, 1996 and 2000. His work uh, currently consists mainly of uh, lower limb arthroplasty and arthroscopy. And yes, he's trained in robotic uh, arthroplasty and has the unique distinction of using the first Mako Robo in India. And uh, he enjoys, uh, apart from uh, academic uh, uh, career, he enjoys uh, long distance running and uh, he's a good cartoonist as well. Um, Dr. Ravichandra Kelkar is, a, uh, is currently a chief and senior consultant orthopedic surgeon at Columbia Asia uh, Hospitals in Bangalore, Karnataka. Uh, he has uh, 20 years of experience in orthopedic surgery and complete 
selected uh, MBBS from Bangalore Medical College, um, which is a premier institute in uh, Karnataka. And uh, he did his MS orthopedics from Jipma Pondicherry. Subsequently trained in the UK for uh, around six years in orthopedics and trauma and, and joint replacement. And he completed the uh, membership degrees in MRCS in a &E and surgery uh, from London and Edinburgh. He's currently uh, practicing, as we have said, uh, at uh, Columbia Asia uh, Hospital in Bangalore. Welcome, um, Dr. Tadi Mohan and KL Kar. Thank you, Shinivas. I'll uh, hand over to... Yeah, you can stop your screen share. Yeah, uh, we welcome Dr. Martinek to start sharing your screen and presentation. So, can you see my presentation? Yes, sir. So, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, session, my third time now. Um, um, and uh, I'm very uh, happy that uh, my uh, teacher and my promoter, Professor Andreas Imhoff, is with us and uh, watching us and uh, discussing with us later. So, uh, the, um, the, the subject of my talk is... Uh, to report about high TB osteotomy and to explain why this therapy is better treatment alternative in younger patients with unicompartimental osteoarthritis. Let me uh, show you where I'm sitting now. This is Google Earth, and I'm right now I'm sitting southeast to Munich, 60 kilometers from Andreas Imhof. Uh, uh, there's a small city called Bad Eibling, not bad. This is a Bad Eibling. And this is actually the, the screen uh, of the hospital uh, last year, newly constructed. And we, we watched the Alps from, from my office. So it's a very nice uh, region to, to live and to work. So this is a picture probably uh, um, you see um, sometimes and thinking about um, what, what is wrong with this, with this guy? So probably all of us, when, when we walk on the street, on the beach, so we see some, some axis deviation, some people limping, and we, we think about it. How could we help this, this guy or, or this, this, this uh, woman? And uh, we, are all, we will all agree that if we look at the x-ray uh, of such guy, there's only one option, and it will be implantation of total knee. Um, but we have got also um, um, situations in uh, also in younger patients which has got deviation. We have we have got pain and problems with the knee joints. But the uh, osteoarthritis is not as serious as in the X-ray before. The, the joint space is narrowed. Uh, there is uh, there are cartilage lesions. Uh, there is a meniscus lacking. There is some deviation of the axis. And uh, we all agree in such. Uh, patients, uh, implantation of total knee arthroplasty would be the, uh, too much. And uh, in those patients, we have got, besides of a conservative treatment, uh, arthroscopic treatment, we've got two options operative. And one is un implantation of unicondylar arthroplasty. And the second one is uh, perf performance of high TBL osteotomy. In most of the cases, valgization for patients with, with virus. Indication for high, high TBL osteotomy are um, Unicompartimental osteotitis with axis deviation. Uh, it can be also performed in instable knee joints and in patients who are a little bit younger. I, I just uh, say 60 years, but this, uh, this um, uh, roger can move. And, this, and the main indications are unicompartimental osteotitis and axis deviation in younger patients. Indications for unicondylar arthroplasties, arthroplasty are also unicompartimental osteoarthritis. Um, with Albeck disease, with osteonecrosis, most of the cases on the media side. And uh, this, this is for patient treatment for patients who are older. And I just say 40, because also this, um, this number has changed during the past years. Yeah. But there are not only a selection, the HSD are not only selection for our treatment. There are many criteria and many choices to select the right treatment for our patients who depend on the patient, on his age, on his health condition, his activity, his body weight, function of the knee joint, a degree of osteoarthritis. And there are also factors dependent on the procedure, the risk of the operations, the, the, the rehabilitation results of, of the operation, and also the uh, 
options of revision. And all those criteria has to be discussed to, uh, to have the best patient, the best option for our patient. Let's talk about the age. So age uh, limits depend not only on, uh, on ethical reasons in Asia and Japanese or Chinese, they perform a high diversity up to 70 or 80s. Has got uh, cultural reasons and also the sex. So we see what I see, high TB osteotomy can be performed in male up to 65 and female a little bit less up to 60, depending on the biological status. And we have got no limits down on the age. Also in kids, we can perform high TB osteotomy. The age limit for unicondyla is 40 plus. So if you look at the age, so uh, high TB osteotomy up to 60 about, but um, in the past, unicondyla was only for older patients. But this, this age limit is moving down. We are getting better results. We are getting better in implants. And uh, so this age is moving down. And there are colleagues among us who perform unicondyla in patients who are over 40. So that means we have got a corridor of, of, um, of an age between 40 and 60, where we could perform both procedures um, or in our patients. The old rule, as I was young, and you see on the left side, as I worked for Professor Emhoff, uh, that doesn't mean young patient will get high TB osteotomy in old patient, there will be unicondylar autoplasty, but there are much other, uh, all, many other criteria and solutions for our decision. Sports activity is one of them. Uh, so what I see, and we can discuss it later, there is some advantage for patients uh, after high TB or osteotomy uh, in comparison to, to unicondylar autoplasty. It's a biological solution uh, and the patients can uh, be able to do better sports than following unicondylar autoplasty. However, uh, contact sports are not recommended. Also body weight is one of the criteria. High uh, body mass is index is a risk for both procedures, but there is no contraindication for both. Also here I see some advantage for patients uh, with high TB osteotomy, especially after we, we got better implants, we have got locking plate fixations and uh, we got uh, good results. So I think in patients who are overweighted, high TB osteotomy would be the better solution. Other criteria, degree of osteoarthritis, uh, dimension of degenerative changes, the stability of the knee joints, as we know, especially in mobile bearing unicondyla, the knee should be stable. If you have got uh, ACL on, or PCL instability, uh, unicondyla cannot be performed, but high TB osteotomy can be performed. Also range of motion is one of the criteria and also location of deformity. And I think um, this is a slide everybody who is performing high TB osteotomy should know. We have to look at the x-rays, we have to look at uh, the defect and we have to decide, is there a intra-articular defect or is there, there a constitutional deformity? And Philipp Lopenhofer, one of our colleagues in Germany, was performing many and many high TB osteotomies in recondylas, um, postulated this in a, one of his publications. And if you have a patient who has got intra-articular defect, uh, only solution for this will be unicondyla because if you perform high TB osteotomy, you will have uh, oblique uh, joint lines on the knee and of the ankle and the results will be disastrous. So if in patients with deformity, with intra-articular defect, only unicondylar replacement is the, is the solution. This other situation with patients and most, most of our patients has got this deformity with constitutional deformity. Most of the cases virus, as you see here on the left, in those patients, you can perform high TB osteotomy. You will make horizontalization of, of the joint lines in the knee and the ankle. You will get very nice results. Or you can also perform unicondylar. You won't correct the, the entire deformity. You will leave it a little bit in virus, but both options are possible. So make all so sure before you start uh, constitutional virus uh, against uh, interarticular deformance. Mobility is also one of very important uh, factors for both procedures. As we know, we can improve mobility and, and mobility, uh, the deflection extension with high tibial osteotomy by correcting the slope. These are old slides. Uh, everybody should know them. If we increase the slope, so we will get better flexion of the knee joint. If we reduce the slope, we will get better extension. And that these are corrections which can be only performed with high TB osteotomy and not with unicondylar in this dimension. 
We have got also very nice effects of this DVR. If you uh, increase the slope, we will uh, get stabilization for, uh, for PCL. If we uh, make extension osteotomy, decrease the slope, so we'll improve ACL uh, instability. So also these factors and these, um, uh, these options are uh, of advantage for uh, high DVR osteotomy. There are many factors which, which depend on the operation also. As you see here, we have got risk of operation, early risk. The injury of nervous peroneus was, was in the past, was, uh, was a, a um, complication of closed wedge osteotomies on the lateral side. But most of the surgeon today, myself also, perform open wedge and we, we don't have those nervous peroneus lesions anymore. Compartment syndrome, vascular lesions, fractures can can happen in after both procedures. And we have got late complications, uh, loss of correction, non-union, change of the patella um, Q angle. Uh, these are problems which can be uh, seen after high TBL osteotomy. Loosening, low-grade infection, allergy are more issues after implantation of unicondyla. And there's also the problem of later TKA. If we need a revision after 10, 15, 20 years, do we have problems following high TB osteotomy or unicondyla? Also here on the pictures you see, this is the problem of the past. Uh, as we perform closed wedge osteotomies, we, we change the offset on the lateral side. And then we had later uh, problems with implantation of, of the TBR implants in total knee. Also in this case, we perform open wedge. We don't have this offset problem anymore. And we don't have this problem in our patients. If you look at the revisions, there are, there's a lot of um, uh, publications which is easier, a revision following high TB osteotomy or uh, following unicondyla. So following high TB osteotomy, what, what can happen? Osteoarthritis can progress in the patellofemoral joint and compress on the lateral side. So that uh, might uh, be the reason for revision. And there, is, there will be some harder exposure for implantation of total knee uh, as a revision. Following unicondyla, we can get loosening, we can get chronic pain. We, we create bone defect on tibia especially. So if we revise unicondyla to total knee later, so we, we, we are a loss of bone, especially on the tibia side. So we, we need in every case, posterior stabilized knee joints. We need bigger polyethylene inserts. And as uh, studies show, there are sooner revisions following unicondyla than following high tibial osteotomy. What about the results? So if you look at the literature, results are uh, as, as, you as you look for them. If you look for good results for high tibia osteotomy, you will find them. If you look for good results for unicondyla, you will find them. So this is an old slide. It was, was already uh, more than 10 years old. But as you see here, the results following high tibia osteotomy are, are excellent. So we have 97.6% after 10 years survival of high TB osteotomy. We have got 85% uh, survival high TB osteotomy after 20 years. So the results are very excellent if we look at the right side. This is a later publication, a meta-analysis, a systemic review, uh, in com a comparison, unicompatible knee arthroplasty versus high TB osteotomy. 15 studies were selected out of 17, more than 1700 publications. And these are the results. So good to excellent results are a, a, a little bit more following unicondyla. However, revisions, there is a slight advantage um, um, regarding high TB osteotomy. So for revision, there's a little bit more uh, um, favorized. What the study uh, say is that valgus high TB osteotomy provides better physical activity for younger patients, whereas unicondyla is more suitable for older patients due to shorter rehabilitation time and faster functional recovery. And if you look at the register, we have got in Scandinavia, in Europe, Scandinavia, in Finland, in Sweden, we have got a lot of data from our registers. And you see that there has been not very nice survival rates of unicondyla in the past, like 73% after 10 years, especially in patients who are younger than 65, uh, there was 1.5 uh, times higher risk for revision compared to older patients over 65. And the same, um, uh, say, as Swedish registry, unicondylar patients 
younger than 55 years have got three times high risk for revision compared to patients over 55. So uh, unicondyla is a very nice option, but for older patients, not for younger patients. A summary in, in the comparison between high TB osteotomy and unicondyla. See, high TB osteotomy can be performed patients younger than 65, unicondyla older than 40. I see advantage for patients regarding sports activity for high TB osteotomy. Body weight is the same program or the same feature for both. With high TB osteotomy, we can make correction of the axis virus vagus. We can treat unstable knee joints also, which we, we don't after unicondyla. But the osteotitis, I didn't talk about it. This is the problem for both. It doesn't mean that uh, the patients are not uh, very satisfied, but this is ju just an issue which we have looked to, but it's the same for both. Complications following the operations about the same for, for both uh, procedures. Uh, the only advantage I see is rehabilitation. It's much shorter following unicondyla because rehabilitation following high is um, is longer and uh, you need second operation for removal of the metal. Results are about the same and I see a small advantage for patients in, in cases of revision following high tibial osteotomy. Let us see what uh, shortly what I do with high tibial osteotomy. Um, Tomofix plate is the standard one since five, since five years. I think Professor Emov is using this plate as well. We use peak power plate, which um, give us very nice clinical results. It's a little bit weird view because you don't see the plate, you see only the screws, but the results are really uh, very nice. And as you see here, artificial bone I use in corrections over 12 degrees, under 12 degrees, you don't lose anything. I'm performing open wedge, computer navigated since uh, more than 15 years. And this is one of the pictures of how we do it, osteotomy and uh, opening. And one of the patients like this, that was 15 degrees um, virus and uh, open which was performed with, um, with artificial bone and with uh, peak power. As a last statement, unicom for unicompartimental osteoarthritis in younger patients, I, I see a clear advantage for osteotomy it is a biological solution for young patients. We can treat instability, we can correct the axis, and we have got um, later advantages for revisions, which are especially very important for younger patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Herman, Dr. Martinak. That was a very beautiful presentation, and um, there were a lot of interesting points for us to learn. Thank you very much. I now invite Dr. Tari Mohan to uh, start his presentation on UK. You can go to, yeah, yeah, you can go to the share screen tab on the bottom in green color. Yeah, you can see. It. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, that is a wonderful talk by uh, Professor Martinek. Um, thank you, sir. Um, so I have actually a, a very little experience compared to your vast line of work. Uh, but I will share my experiences. So my name is Thadi Mohan. Uh, I'm working as a clinical professor in Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. This is a southern part of India. Unfortunately, I don't have a map. I wish I had uh, bought a map for you. But um, my experience uh, I will share is about mostly robotic arm assisted unicondylar knee arthroplasty in unicompartmental disease. 
So as you all know from uh, the previous talk, unicompartmental disease can be uh, not just a medial compartment, but the lateral compartment, patellofemoral compartment, and also uh, you can have bicompartmental. So this is the institute where I work. Uh, it's uh, the, almost at the southern tip of uh, India in a state called Kerala. Uh, that's the institute. Uh, it's uh, full of, uh, it's like a tropical paradise, uh, full of coconut trees and backwaters. So you're all welcome. My uh, experience with uh, unicompartmental knee, or the introduction goes back to several years ago when I was working in uh, UK. I did uh, uh, Oxford uh, knee course uh, almost 15 years ago. Um, which was hosted by Professor uh, David Murray. Uh, and that was my introduction. And those days, there were a lot of uh, consultants in the UK who were uh, on the Oxford knee bandwagon. They were doing a lot of Oxford knees. And uh, along with the numbers, we also see a lot of, uh, we saw a lot of uh, complications as well. The robotic experience came uh, much later, actually much more recently when uh, our institute, the Amrita Institute, uh, they uh, purchased the first uh, vehicle robot in India. And this was way back in 2017, so just three years ago. Uh, so initially we got the software for total hip and partial knees and then a year later we got the total knee software as well. And uh, it's called the Mako robot because uh, it's named after a shark, which is found in Florida. So that's where the company is located. So our institute is developing uh, an advanced center for robotic uh, surgery in various departments. So they have acquired uh, the Rosa robot for neurosurgeons, the Da Vinci uh, robot for uh, gastro surgery, urological surgeries, uh, pelvic surgery, and they also have the cyber knife for uh, uh, oncology. So as part of that, uh, we were lucky to uh, acquire the Mako robot. So for me, it was uh, a big change because all of a sudden I had to undergo this certification uh, and the company is very uh, strict that unless you are certified, you should not use the robot. So we went through all the certification and uh, met a lot of wonderful surgeons from various countries, picked up a lot of uh, tips and tricks. Um, and it was a new uh, a learning for me because all these years I had been doing, uh, you know, I had been eyeballing, we had the brain lab for a short while I mean, we still have it, but I preferred uh, doing it manually, mostly using the jigs. And all of a sudden, we had this technology, uh, which is the Mako system, which essentially consists of uh, the uh, arm. The Mako arm is this body here. And it's got two monitor screens. One is for the surgeon uh, to keep looking at. There is a, a camera and there is a, a console there for uh, uh, a product specialist to work on. And I'll talk about that person shortly. The Mako system is versatile in that in, in one platform, you can do all kinds of replacements, meaning uh, to this uh, arm, you can attach a reamer for the hip replacement. You can attach a six mm burr for uh, unique compartmental knee replacement. Or you can attach a saw if you want to, to do the total needs. Um, so that was quite exciting. And this is the product specialist. So this person uh, is very integral to doing the robotic surgery. So uh, it is an another personnel in the operation theater along with uh, the rest of the team. This person, uh, I mean, usually it's only one person, but the person is responsible for doing the CT scan planning of this surgery. Uh, so they do a patient-specific personalized implant pre-planning. They discuss all this with the surgeon, of course. And they are manning the robot during the case. They are uh, putting the data input. They are also responsible for training the uh, 
uh, theater staff. So as uh, Prof said, the partial knee is, makes up almost, um, uh, you know, 30% of uh, osteoarthritis unit compartmental. So that is where a partial knee comes in. So you can have uh, a medial uni for uh, medial unit compartmental disease, which is more than 50% mostly. And then you have also lateral unicompartmental uh, knee replacement, patellofemoral replacement, and bicompartmental, where you can combine patellofemoral with one of the uh, lateral or medial units. So all this is uh, uh, something we have started doing. Uh, now the prevalence of uh, uh, partial knee to give an idea, it's about 10% in the UK. And even in my practice, um, I do around 10 to 15%. It is going up um, over the last couple of years. Um, the other thing uh, arthroplastic surgeons will note is that there is a high percentage of knee replacements that we do where we feel that uh, a unicompartmental would have sufficed. Uh, so, so why perform a uh, unique compartment uh, when, you know, when there's a total knee option? So both are equally successful, but a uh, unique compartment has got a better range of motion, better kinematics, lesser pain, earlier rehab, faster recovery, faster return to work, lesser blood loss, obviously, almost more transfusions. You are retaining the, the ligaments, the crucial ligaments are being retained. And it's much uh, better tolerated by older, less healthy patients. The patients feel the knee is more normal. The forgotten knee score is much better. Uh, papers are shown for uh, unicompartmental arthroplasties. But ultimately, uh, the proper patient selection is the key. You can't uh, do it in all uh, patients within the knee. Um, you start, uh, once you have got into this, I noticed that I have been looking out for unicompartmental disease in your outpatient practice. Uh, and you, you start seeing more and more. Um, then you have to ask yourself, is it bad enough to need replacing? Is a patient, is he convinced for surgery, he or she, or are they quite happy, you know, trying conservative? Of course, when all else is failed, then uh, surgery is, is required. The important thing is that deformity has to be correctable. If it is uh, not correctable passively, then the unicompartmental stage has, you know, is uh, lost. You miss the boat, and you have to do a total. And the other thing here uh, in robotic, particularly CT scan, is a must for preplan. So how I work up my patients is uh, do the usual X-rays. Uh, the other thing we do is we do a full length uh, x-rays, which help us. We have a pack system so we can draw the angles and we can uh, calculate how much deformity is there, uh, etc. And uh, the usual uh, x-rays are done. The other thing which uh, I also do uh, lately is the Rosenberg view, 45 degree flexion. If you are a bit unsure, you can do the... Uh, flexion AP view uh, to see uh, whether there is a compression of the compartment that helps you in deciding unicompartmental disease. So the range of movement is important. Uh, you need to have at least 90 degrees, maybe more is better. Always. No recurvatum. As Prof has said, uh, the age is coming down. Uh, the range I uh, believe in is 40 to 80 years. Though my uh, youngest patients are all more than 50, I haven't operated anyone uh, in their 40s yet. Um, as to the body mass index, um, many surgeons have said it really doesn't matter. Even the Oxford people, Oxford group has said obesity is not a contraindication. But uh, uh, in India, we, we uh, I mean, at least I haven't operated uh, unis in very obese patients. Uh, 30s BMI, 35, 36 years, but uh, no one beyond 40s yet. Uh, the angular deformity that I accept is 
they say 10 degrees whereas and 10 degrees valgus, but you can push it to maybe 12. Uh, beyond 15, uh, I think it's a bad idea. All the time, you should make sure that the deformity is correctable clinically. There should not be a global pain. It should be fairly well localized. And you can accept uh, a certain degree of patellofemoral joint involvement also. So this is uh, something which we already discussed that obesity is not a contraindication about the ACL being intact. They have now said that with a fixed bearing, uh, you don't really have to worry too much, but many surgeons also recommend ACL reconstruction and uh, unique compartment replacement at the same time. I haven't done any like that. Most of the pay, I mean, virtually all the patients that I have done, uh, they, I make sure the ACL is intact clinically. If I have any doubt, sometimes on very uh, less occasions, I have done an MRI just to make sure. The age group, 40 to 80, uh, BMI has been less than 40 so far for me. I avoid inflammatory disease and it's mostly uh, you know, osteoarthritis. Um, angular deformity, like I said, I'll push it up to 12, maybe 15. Sorry. Um, and I make sure uh, there is not much of a fixed patch deformity, either less than 10 degrees. Angular motion should be at least 90 uh, and preferably more. So uh, one of the things that is very unique to robotic uh, unique compartmental is the CT scan. So most of the planning occurs uh, on the CT scan. So it's an image-based system. Um, so the lower limb is scanned 0.5 to 1 mm slices are taken. All this information is fed into the system software. And the patient-specific anatomic planning is done. Uh, this helps uh, the surgeon to decide on the implant size, uh, the optimal position and alignment, even before we have actually started the surgery. And also, once the surgery has started, you can fine-tune the position uh, intraoperatively based on a ligament balancing and tracking. So this is how a femoral uh, planning screen looks like. You can, it's, it's a virtual model of the patient's own knee and uh, you can uh, reproduce the size of the implant. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, you can move the implant uh, towards the notch and place it exactly where you want. Um, make sure that it's not proud or it's uh, not sticking up too much. So there are various cuts like sagittal transfers, coronal where you can adjust your implant perfectly. The tibial screen is also versatile in that uh, you can uh, uh, get the maximal coverage, make sure it's not overhanging. And you, make it, you can make sure that you're not intruding onto the uh, ACL uh, attachment. Uh, so uh, the implant uh, doesn't uh, basically go up the hill up, uh, you know, towards the tibial spine. And they say you should not cross more than half of it. And uh, you can mimic the anatomic tibial slope. I mean, being CT scan, um, you can get the uh, tibial slope perfectly and you mimic uh, perfectly. And uh, that way it's uh, versatile. The skin incision, uh, I prefer the, the usual longitudinal midline incisions. Uh, you can make it smaller. I've seen smaller incisions. Once you're comfortable, you can, you can make it much smaller, but I prefer to do it like a TKR, uh, TKA, uh, where I can see the entire knee. The registration is then done where uh, the bony landmarks are recorded. There are checkpoints which are placed um, for the femur and tibia. Um, this is just to show how the balancing of the knee takes place. Uh, you have to put these arrays on the leg uh, and on the thigh of the femur, just like navigation. And uh, by moving the knee through various degrees, you can make sure that the ligament balance is uh, perfect. 
uh, is not to lose or not to tight. So uh, you can see here that there are markers on the thigh of the thigh and leg of the patient. And also there is uh, the array is one array is attached to the, the robotic, uh, to, to the robot as well. Uh, and to the uh, yeah, robotic arm instrument there, that, that comes off during the surgery. So the one thing about uh, performing a unique compartment plastic is the registration of the bony points is the key. The, the, it's basically like how good information you are giving the computer, uh, the better the registration, the more accurate is the operation. So it's very, very important that you uh, go through all these points So see, I think he lost the connection, looks like. I can hear only you. Yeah, I think um, his screen seems to be frozen. Daddy, are you online? No. I am online. Yeah, I think, yeah, Daddy lost. I think the connection is lost. lost. Dr. Kirko, you have uh, some questions to ask Dr. Martinek or yeah. something to discuss. I was wondering if, if the knee is ACL deficient, do you still go ahead and do HTO or would you construct the ACL and then do HTO simultaneously? Actually, you have got both options. Either you perform HTO first and uh, look uh, what is the, how is the patient uh, satisfied and yeah. perform high, uh, this ACL uh, a year later, during you remove the plate, or you perform this uh, procedure simultaneously at the same time. Maybe Professor Imov can say some words too. Yeah, if you if you do simultaneously, will you mobilize the patient immediately? Because then you will lead to knee stiffness if you don't mobilize them immediately. I, I mobilize always, or also following high TB osteotomy, so you can mobilize okay. normally. Yes, I think. In most cases, there's not an indication to do both at the same time because about two thirds of these patients are happy just to have an HDO in chronic ACL deficiency. Yeah. So it's still maybe 20, 30%, they need a second ACL. So really rare. Previously, we did it more and more in, at the same time as possible, and especially with the new plates like the peak power blade from Artrex, where we can change the angle of each screw, the ABC screw, you can change the angle so you have enough space for an, for an additional tunnel, ACL or PCL, so it's possible. But still remember, not all patients. Um, ask the patient what is really your problem, if they have pain or instability, if they have both, then you can do both at the same time. And it, the rehabilitation time is the same because our osteotomy today is so stable that you can start immediately like your normal rehab after ACL reconstruction. You don't need some restriction or um, the recovery can just start normally as you always do with your ACLs. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you prefer open wedge or closed wedge or dome? Which, which are the ones, which osteotomies do you normally prefer? Ooh. Is it more of an open wedge, closed wedge, chevron? I, I, in the past, as we started with Professor Emma of 20 years ago, 25, a closed wedge was, uh, was the standard. And uh, today, in the last 15 years, I performed one, clo one closed wedge and uh, all others open. 99.9% .9 open wedge. Yeah. It's probably easier to convert later on. 
open, which is uh, creating new bone. So it's much better. You know, you don't have osteo yeah. problems. You don't have the risk for lateral yeah. uh, nerval lesions. And open choice is, I think, uh, I, I do not anybody anymore who is performing close switch. Yeah. There might be a, a discussion, you know, you, you, uh, you can change the length of the leg. If you make, if you've got longer legs, so you can reduce the leg length few millimeters if you perform closed wedge but uh i this is uh, this is really very very rare reason for there are some yeah. indications after fracture if you have a fracture deformity on the lateral yeah. compartment or medial compartment especially medial compartment you see when you calculate all the angles then there are some indicate still some indications to a closed wedge because otherwise you cannot correct the alignment of the tibial plateau but it's very yeah. seldom and remember, closed wedge osteotomy on the lateral tibia side, you have a lot of pernal problems, pernal nerve problems. About 30%, you can measure it when you do an EMG. About 10% have really a problem. So we should not do it in a normal way today. Yeah. Can I just ask a couple of questions, uh, uh, Professor Imhoff and uh, Dr. Martini? Uh, the previous literature is mainly on closed wedge osteotomy, isn't it, for, uh, for HTOs? Do we have good literature on open wedge osteotomy comparing with uh, unicondylar at the moment? And also, uh, what percentage of your practice you do uh, HTOs and, uh, uh, and unis? Andreas, would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, it depends on your patients mm -hmm. and uh, the population you treat. We, in our department, we really treat more uh, sports athletes, even if they are older, they still want to go in the, into the Alps. They want to go for skiing, biking, hiking, and so on. So they want to be more active. And that's why we do more and more. We still are doing a lot of HTO, even if they are over 60. Um, if they don't have really patelliform, fellow, patellofemoral problems and they want to be uh, doing some sports in, in this high, uh, with a lot of impact, I think that's still a good indication. Okay. Yeah, uh, so can uh, we? I'm sorry, can we have Dr. To Tadiman to continue the program? Maybe we can have five yes. to seven minutes for the program to uh, presentation to close. Okay. So, Dr. Dadi is continuing his, his talk? Yeah, we will have uh, around five to seven minutes for Dr. Dadi to continue his presentation and then we will have some more discussions. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, sorry about that. I don't know why the computer froze suddenly. Uh, but uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Clear. Yeah, so uh, like I was saying, uh, the Bone uh, registration is a, is, a, is a critical part in uh, uh, this surgery. And yeah, as you can see, there are about 40 points you have to uh, touch with the probe uh, to register it. Um, so the uh, optical arrays, um, they record all this. And you can also map the cartilage uh, to make sure that your implant is not uh, too proud compared to the rest of the normal cartilage. So cartilage mapping, and then you can do centralized tracking. Uh, there is something called a top-down view where you can make sure that your implants are moving uh, over each other in flexion and extension. So that makes it easy whether uh, you can always change the position of your implant accordingly. And the basic colors in a robotic uh, unique compartmental is that the green uh, is uh, the planned resection bone. When you over resect or you have gone too deep, uh, it shows red. Uh, and uh, when you have uh, the native bone or the bone has been resected, it turns white. And the other good thing about robotic, uh, which I find very uh, useful, is there's a haptic window, which is a tactile uh, protection for the surgeon so that um, you can never wander. The, the burr or the saw uh, cannot wander too far off. You cannot do uh, any soft tissue damage. You will uh, stick to the bony windows, um, uh, safe windows, which will, uh, you know, protect uh, or 
prevent any soft tissue uh, injury. And uh, the burring is very precise. Uh, to give you an idea, you can just see this uh, picture where uh, you know it has precisely burred exactly uh, how you planned on the on the pre-op computer uh, image, um, and it's amazing uh, how you can see the the ACL uh, not a single fiber is damaged. It is so precise, uh, and you can you can uh, put the implant uh, perfectly. The insert fits in, it's a fixed bearing, like I said. Um, and this is the implant. Some of the surgeons I have spoken to have said that they, they don't routinely do ACL reconstruction if it is found to be torn. Um, however, some uh, have advised that if it's a heavy patient, it's always better to do a reconstruction and uh, a compartment replacement. So this is just to show um, that even patellofemoral can be replaced. Um, just one such case. Um, this is a lateral uh, uni. Uh, I have done about 10 lateral unis and I find that it is uh, uh, very satisfying with the robotic um, method. So these are the various cases that we have done. Uh, we have done them by some by compartment also. So in my experience, uh, the benefits of uh, unit compartmental has been that there's uh, more confidence in planning and execution and uh, feedback is immediate. You can see the patient mobilizing very soon uh, as early as in the evening or the next day. Surgery is very precise, less bone and soft tissue damage, less pain, better early recovery. We have noticed that our hospital stays uh, have reduced uh, for the patients after unis and they can go home as early as uh, two to three days. It is safe and reproducible. There's a short learning curve. Uh, studies have shown it can be as less as 10 cases uh, before you get to uh, understand and do it quite well. Our numbers are increasing and it's a useful uh, training and teaching as well as a research tool because we have a lot of postgraduates and they uh, learn um, uh, various aspects of this uh, robotic assisted uh, arthroplasty. This is one such paper which we have uh, done, we have sent it for publication. Uh, it is basically um, comparing tibial uh, and femoral uh, tibial component positioning uh, with Oxford, some of the Oxford that we have done in the past, uh, we have compared it with the robotics and we have found that uh, with the robotics it's much more accurate and precise. And basically uh, the pre-op three-dimensional plan with enhanced accuracy gives rise to conservation of bone, improved outcome and reduced complications. And earlier uh, you know, the manual UK had a lot of problems of poor tracking alignment, overstuffing, vertical soft cuts causing fractures. Uh, but now, thanks to the robotic, we are able to address all those problems of alignment, rotation, uh, tibial slope much better. Uh, it's much more accurate, definitely. And uh, the haptic, I think, is a big advantage that you find. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tadimohan. Um, you can stop sharing your screen. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, I hand over the program to Professor Andreas and Dr. Ravi Kelko. We would like to have your opinions and discussion. Yeah. I think the basic concept would be patient selection, which is very important because with HTO or UKA, if you don't have the right patient, even with the right uh, uh, sort of mind, it is difficult to get a good result. So I think patient selection is the bottom line in both these situations. What would you say, Mr. Martin Ekdor? So, uh, 
So a question to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. That's I, I, I tried to show in my talk that the selection is yeah. the most important step of our, of our operation. The operation yeah. itself can be performed by experienced surgeon, but the selection is really very, very, very yeah. uh, difficult sometimes and very personal. So you have to look at all yeah. those criteria, what the patient yeah. wants, wants to, how is his uh, compliance, what are, what are his uh, options for sports, his body yeah. mass, his, his activities, and also uh, make a, a good, a good um, uh, diagnostics. You, know, you, need, uh, you need the leg length, uh, the yeah. entire unique MRI, and um, then you can decide. Yeah, when you, when you do a HTO, uh, Professor Martinek, and you find it's grade three, grade four, OA, some borderline grade three, would you still go ahead with HTO, or would you no. normally do an MRI in most cases and then decide beforehand? Three degrees is um, I I don't think so. Three degrees is is uh, enough. So I would start with six, six seven degrees. So yeah. if, if you correct three degrees and you make over correction more, they have got oblique uh, join line later and the patient will have pain. No, I was uh, uh, talking in terms of the uh, severity of arthritis. Say if it's a grade three arthritis, would you still do the HTO? Okay, okay. okay. I, I misunderstood. I thought you may, you're yeah. talking about the axis. Sure, I'm, uh, that's what I learned. That's what I learned in, in Munich at Technical University from my teacher. So I treat degree four degrees. So if you've got uh, no cartilage on, we make microfracture, we make uh, abrasion, we make kind of uh, uh, bone marrow stimulation to, yeah. to get some recovery of the, of the pseudo cartilage. It's not a normal cartilage, it's a fibrous cartilage, but uh, we perform it uh, together with high tibiostotomy. So in our operations, in my operations, the first part is arthroscopy, medial yeah. release, Treatment of the of the joint space of the joint, uh, uh, um, and then in the second part we perform the high tibia osteotomy. Okay. Yeah. So arthroscopy yeah, is obligatory to every high tibia osteotomy. Yeah, that's arthroscopy is not obligatory. Yeah. To yeah. Okay. So if you feel it's too bad, then you won't do the HTO. Uh, can you repeat the, the question? If, when you do the arthroscopy and you feel the Arthritis is too severe, then you won't do the HTO. Yeah, so if it, if the arthritis on the lateral side serious, yeah. and if, if the arthritis is very serious, patellofemoral, so I have to change the the option. Yeah, so th yeah, that's what I want because I was wondering uh, whether you do it before surgery. So you're uh, going to do an arthroscopy first and then an HTO. Exactly. In all cases. In all cases. Yeah. Okay. What about uh, Professor Imhoff? How will you do it, sir? Yeah, I think the, the most important part is really activity of the patient, the yeah. stability of the knee joint, and also the body weight. Yeah. And three parts are really the most important. And you can then you can decide it in advance what you really want to do. So I shouldn't. We shouldn't do the. Um, decide when we have the arthroscopy. We can do yeah. it, it's just add on, but the first decision should be done before you start into the surgery. So activity for me is the most important part. Even if you have a, a grade four on the middle side and grade two on the lateral side, you still can do it. If there, yeah. if he's 35 or something like that, you still do an HTO. Um, yeah. Doesn't matter if there's grade four on the middle side. So it's more or less age and activity. I think this is the part we should discuss. Yeah, yeah. And then there are other people, they don't want to go, they don't want to do some sports. They, they live more in a sedentary, they live in the office. They don't have a lot of activity around. And then they're happy with a U, UKA, whatever you do it in a, if you do it by hand or by, with your robotic, yeah. it doesn't matter, but they, it's fast, easy and the recovery time is really fast. True. I think uh, in uh, in addition, in terms of cost also, it's pretty cheap because doing an UK is almost similar to doing a TK in terms of costs. It depends on your on your country. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Tadi, I, have, I really would like to thank you. Your presentation is wonderful. And I learned a lot of your precision. So I, I like it not really. But tell me, if you have done now, let's say 50 cases, are you still using the robotic? Or you are better than the robotic? I, after we have uh, got the robot, I virtually stopped doing Oxfords. That was the only other uh, manual uh, we, found that we were doing. But now uh, we find that it's definitely much more precise, much more safer uh, using the robot. Um, and also the intraoperative uh, ligament balancing we find is much more is fine uh, with the robot. You can uh, you can be so precise as to decide exactly how much depth of bone you want to take out uh, and you know, not go any deeper. So I think there is uh, no guessing anymore. There is, uh, you know, it's all there. The, the, the numbers are there to show you and the results are there. And we are also noticing the physios immediately, they mentioned uh, that, you know, the patients are moving faster. They are staying shorter time in the hospital. So overall, we are much more happier with uh, the robotic. So uh, we don't do all robotic, you're right. Um, you know, uh, partials we are doing, that is unique compartments, we are doing virtually only robotic. Total- yeah. uh, My question is, what about your experience? Let's say in five years, yeah. are you, do you will be better than the robotic? Definitely, definitely. I think, uh, you know, with every case, you are picking up small tips uh, and you know, there something to tweak it here to release this, uh, you know, uh, or uh, to do it slightly different in another case. So I think every case you, you, uh, you know, you are fine tuning your art. So I think uh, certainly there is uh, something to learn. Correct. I really I like got also questions to Dr. Tony. I really like the balancing because balancing is something you can do with your hands and your eyes, but I think your your system is more precise. I think there are a lot of. I think there are enough studies to say that uh, maybe a computer navigated knee because I do computer navigated needs regularly, but there is no scientific hard data to say that an experienced surgeon is no better than a computer because in terms of long term longevity, survival of the implant, revision rates compared to a computerized knee and a uh, manual knee with an experienced surgeon, the results are almost similar in terms of survivorship of the implant. No, that is true. I mean, I think, uh, uh, but I think, you know, uh, end of the day, when uh, you know you have placed your implant, uh, say, much more precisely, you have uh, you have a screen to tell you that uh, and a much reliable way of knowing that, yes, uh, you know, you have uh, corrected it so much, you have placed it so much, uh, your alignment has got corrected. Uh, I think in the long term, it will definitely uh, pay dividends. So uh, we have short term, we have midterm results with uh, computerized uh, robotic uh, uh, unique compartmentals, which are showing uh, uh, very uh, good values. Of course, long term, you're right. I mean, if a very experienced surgeon uh, versus a robot, maybe there is not much of a difference. But, uh, you know, all these are uh, uh, conjectures. I mean, I think uh, we can take home the message that. Uh, very well done UK or HTO is very, very good. But on the other side, we do have uh, uh, to go ahead with innovation. So uh, what is very expensive now can get cheaper over the time, just like possibly a 3D bioprinting on the cartilage or an autologous chondrocyte imp implantation of the cartilage. Yes, but they, uh, I mean, uh, we have to understand also that they cannot be extrapolated to the general population. So the younger patient, Younger uh, orthopedicians should take into consideration that um, the skills and the principles is what is very important. And yes, 
it's good to know about uh, robotics possibly in future um accessibility or the expenses are possibly going to get uh, better yeah dr shrinivas you have something yeah i think uh, uh, just to say that you know manual and robotics uh, looking at the registry data also um uh, the uh, the data for unis is actually not not very favorable uh, in uh, in finish register i think they have stopped doing unis i'm not sure what uh, the reasons exactly probably the results are, have been poor initially like uh, professor martinek had uh, highlighted in the australian registry also the numbers have uh, reduced gradually but then uh, they have actually picked up later i think probably because of uh, uh, robotics and there was a mention about increasing numbers of robotics being done um, is it is it going to be the initial enthusiasm or is it going to be increasing in the future with robotics Martin, I think, yeah, that is a good question. I mean, like all technology, uh, you know, that, that is the question. Is it just a, uh, a blimp, um, you know, is it a one-off thing? Uh, will a few years down the line, will everyone get bored? Uh, but I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know, I've been doing uh, uh, manual uh, replacements uh, you know, for the for the past 15 years, and uh, I was actually, to be honest, uh, finding it a bit monotonous. And uh, there were times when I felt that I was either over over treating. Um, sometimes I felt I was uh, eyeballing too much uh, without uh, you know uh, anything definite. And that has changed. I mean, I can see that. Uh, now at least I have something to fall back. There is a, a, a screen to show that uh, you know your values are, are correct, uh, and things which were not I was not doing before I started doing. So my my attitude towards uh, uh, arthroplasty has changed. I mean I can see that it is uh, a much more technical, uh, uh, you know, demanding surgery when you are treating a. Unique compartment compared to a total compartment. I mean, be it, be it HTO or uh, you know, uh, unique compartmental. Once your or attention is restricted to one compartment, it becomes much more difficult and technically demanding. How you do it? Uh, so you have to get your angles correct. You have to get your alignment correct. And uh, I think uh, results we know are. You know, equally good, or uh, you know, maybe some are better with H2O, some are better with Unis, but uh, it's highly technical. I find that that is what is, uh, you know, the take home message and patient selection is very important. You have to select your patient carefully before you embark on any of these operations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Uh, I think uh, Martinek has something to ask. I, I, I go back to, to Unicondyla and to Dr. Tadi. So you you told us that you will perform um, Unicondyla valg for valgus deformity up to 12, 15 degrees. And as we know, even for total knee, valgus more than 10 degrees is very, very difficult to, to get balanced. And uh, how can you manage it to perform Unicondyla is such, such deformities? You can correct a little bit virus, but valgus is very difficult. Uh, um, uh, very demanding. So uh, how can you manage 12 degrees of bulgus with lateral unicondylar arthroplasty? Yeah, I think uh, my uh, approach is the same. I don't do a, a, you know, lateral parapetalar approach for a lateral uni. I, I do it the usual way, just like I do a total knee and a medial uni. I do the same incision. In the pre-op planning, uh, one thing we do is uh, the rotation of the implant is very important. So, uh, you know, you can, uh, the tibial plate especially, they advise uh, to be rotated quite a bit um, externally, uh, or rather, uh, yeah, it is, uh, we are doing lateral, sorry. 
So uh, it has to be internally rotated more than uh, 12 degrees. That is important. Apart from that, uh, you know, because uh, the haptics are there in the robot, the exposure is not so important in the sense you don't need a big window of exposure. Even through a small window, the burr will take off the exact amount of bone in the correct place without you having to retract uh, the joint too much. So that is a big advantage here. So, uh, you know, so much so that sometimes you are looking at the screen uh, it's almost like playing a video game. You're looking at the screen and turning uh, into, on turning the green bone into white. And you are not so, uh, you know, worried about um, having to look exactly where you're burning. Uh, so it is extremely safe that way. And uh, I have not found it particularly difficult. So there are a few tweaks like that, uh, how you place your components. Uh, but apart from that, you know, the correction is perfect. I mean, you can, you, you know, you don't have to release a lot either. Soft tissue release also is not too much. Um, the correction is very good. So one thing is there, uh, you should not push your uh, angular deformities too much. I remember one case where I was very uh, ambitious and uh, there was a, a patient with a virus more than uh, 15 degrees. I mean, almost maybe... 15 to 20 degrees, but not more than that. Uh, but it was fully correctable. Surprisingly, before the surgery, I could correct the deformity. However, when I opened the knee joint, I was uh, shocked to see that the ACL was completely gone. And, uh, you know, at that point of time, I didn't feel like doing uh, ACL reconstruction. And I just converted it into a total knee because there was already some wear on the other side as well. So I just converted it into a uh, total knee instead of a uni. So that was one instance where I changed my plan uh, from a uni to a total uh, on the table. That was the only case. But that, that uh, I realized that my mistake was I had pushed the limit too far. I had gone, uh, you know, 15 degrees uh, and beyond, which I shouldn't. So now I stick to 12 degrees, less than 12 degrees, I'm happy to do a uni. Beyond that, I'm very, very uh, cautious. I just, uh, I just ask a question, Professor Martinek and Professor Imhoff, uh, regarding the high tibial osteotomies, uh, from the point of uh, per patient perception, uh, do you think they feel, uh, you know, the best with their knees? after a few, say, months or years down the line, um, rather than immediately after the procedure. For the unicompartmental knees, the patient feels best um, after the procedure, immediately after the procedure. Whereas in uh, HTOs, uh, they, they tend to get better over time. Uh, what time do you think they generally get better? and How long does it last? So, I I'm regularly remove the plates after one year, if everything <coughs> is going uh, okay. So I think uh, the, the most of the patient feels the, this plate on the on the media side because sitting on the on the piece anterior. So uh, for me, the time point where they really get very good is after removing this plate. So I I'm, when I prepare my patients, I always say it will take more than one year then before you really get into the position into the, the feeling, everything is okay. So you your views, please. Yeah, I agree. We said UKA, it's quite, it's quite faster and the patient feel the comfort immediately. Um, with HDO, the nature needs more time. It's a biological part. They need more time for recovery, recovery of the cartilage, of the ligament, of the stability. They have a new axis. They have to learn to walk. They will feel it in the hips and the spine. So it's more or less something for the whole body. It's not only just on the joint. That's why uh -huh. it's more time. Sometimes three months, but it doesn't need one year. So it needs about what I tell them about three months, because after three months, they can do almost everything. They can do all, all kinds of sports because it's healed. 
even if the, the space is not filled completely, the osteotomy is stable enough to do everything. Sir, uh, Martinic, I was very impressed with, uh, you know, your post-op x-rays uh, with the bone graft and uh, the, the plate that you use. Uh, it looks so neat. <laughs> uh, my only question is, uh, uh, you know, you have so much experience. What is uh, your feeling of whether the uh, cartilage regenerates on the, for example, when you've done a HTO, where does the cartilage, uh, you said fibro cartilage develops, but how long does that take and uh, how good is it, that cartilage? So what, what I... I don't know how exactly, uh, how long is the, the entire development of the cartilage, but I, as I, I removed the blades after 12 months, 13 months. So I see the, the, uh, the um, quality of the, of the tissue, which uh, cr is created there. And it's after 12 months, it's still not normal cartilage, no normal fiber cartilage. It, uh, it is, it is a tissue, but it's still kind of soft, but it uh, seems to, to it seems to work. Uh, so this is a little bit harder, a little bit better organized on the femoral side and a little bit softer on the tibia side. But um, I cannot say that after one year, we got uh, complete fiber cartilage. So I think that the process goes on for, for long, longer, yeah. yes. But the yes. patient feel the, 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 the shift of the axis. So they, they are already uh, okay, you know, so they, they have got options. The other thing I have found is that if they lose cartilage on, say, uh, one of the compartments, they start complaining of the knee giving way, you know, when they are walking. Uh, they say the knee is giving way. Many times I have felt that, I mean, is this a cartilage problem or is this a, a lax ACL or is there a meniscal tear? But all these patients, when, when I have opened the knee, I have found the meniscus is pristine. There is no problem with the meniscus. The ACL is intact. And it's only the cartilage over the condyle, the, the cartilage in certain areas, it's completely gone. And you have ivory like bone. The bone is like ivory. And both on the, on the tibial and the femoral side, you have like ulcers of ivory hard bone. And this bone, when it is slipping, because it's so shiny and so hard, I, and I, I get the feeling that maybe that is what is, is suddenly giving them that giving way feeling. Uh, have you noticed that? So, uh, yes, you, you are right. This uh, kind of uh, loss of space or uh, cartilages on both sides, four millimeters, we have got eight millimeters, uh, um, instability or, or game, so I may, they may, may feel it. That's why we make uh, overcorrection in such cases, the so-called Fujisawa. So we shift uh, the Mikulic line to the lateral side, that we get away from those, or, or from those, from this interface. So, so they walk on the lateral side more, and then we support it with with orthesis, and we we support it with in um, insoles, lateral enhancement. So it might be it might be kind of uh, instability feeling for the patients. And do you ever uh, have to? I mean, have you had to combine HTO with with ACL reconstruction anytime ever? Yeah, so the Professor Imhoff has got very very nice studies performed twenty years ago. Um, my colleagues performed this. You can you can read about it. It's in the literature. So uh, there's been a uh, lot of thesis on it. So large numbers of uh, combined procedures at this time, 20 years ago, we did, we did high, high TB osteotomy, ACL, OATS, and a collagen meniscus transplant. Mm -hmm. So that was really high end surgery. So mm -hmm. we did all at once. And now we shift a little bit, as Professor uh, Imhoff told, we, we shift a little bit, you know, to, to make uh, make less and make uh, look at the patients on his demands and maybe do these additional procedures later. It's also a matter of money because in our society, we get only paid by one operation. If you perform ACL, HDO, CMI, OAT, you get only one operation paid. 
So you you are losing money if you do uh, everything on in at once. Just a job, you know. This uh, should be a criteria for us, but it's also. <coughs> No, no, that is a very valid point because I'm aware that with HTO alone, you can, you know, you can treat uh, uh, these instabilities, PCL, ACL instabilities, just by altering the incline itself, you can, you can treat it. So I was wondering whether you really have to do, uh, you know, the reconstruction. <coughs> As you know, in dogs, especially in dogs, if they tear the ACL in the past, you didn't perform ACL reconstruction, you do it today. But uh, the, the, the doctors did high TB osteotomy for stabilization of the knee joint of the dog. So they got more stability. So we are not dogs, but it's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of option. So you get stabilization if you make vagization of the knee. Okay. I think uh, Dr. Matnak was saying that uh, he has a commitment uh, uh, exactly at 90 minutes. So I have one last question. There is a question from the audience. Um, this was covered, but just to uh, repeat it, uh, what if the patellofemoral joint is also involved? Will you proceed with a high tibial osteotomy? Uh, the question is to Dr. Martinek, um, how much of patellofemoral joint involvement is okay for you to proceed with a high tibial osteotomy? Patient's pain. So you have to look at the patients exactly and preoperatively, if he says he has got patellofemoral pain, so you have to be aware of, of his changes, but patellofemoral degenerative changes of the patellofemoral joint are no contraindication for either high TB osteotomy nor for unicondyla. As we know from arthroplasty, most of the surgeons do not replace um, the, the patellar uh, uh, surface. So uh, you, you have to ask the patient. If I got no pain, you can go for it. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful answer. I think that was a wonderful discussion. Uh, does anyone else have anything else to discuss? Uh, just one more yeah. uh, question, just one last question. In India, we see a lot of patients who want to have deep squats. Um, so which is a better option for having deep squats? It's a very difficult question because most of them, they already have patellar, fibro, patellar femoral problems, not only medial compartment or lateral compartment. So if this is really a problem, then I think we should replace also patellar femoral. I think that's not a good idea for HTO or UK. <coughs> what are you that's doing? That's a beautiful answer. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very beautiful answer. What does uh, Dr. Tari Mohan and Dr. Martin want to say re regarding this? In deep squats, so you can enhance the slope a little bit so get be better flexion for, for the patients or what, what I also consider in uh, my Arabic patients. And I do, and I perform total uh, knee arthroplasty. I, I try to enhance the slope a little bit to get better flexion, to get better mobility towards deep squats. But uh, what about the pain? The pain is not going to change, I guess, patellofemoral pain. No, I, I did not ask. Uh, I mean, patellofemoral joint, uh, you know, may not be involved much. You don't okay. uh, have for both, isn't it? Okay, All okay. they want is deep squats. Yeah, so yeah, which is yeah, a better yeah. option for yeah, having yeah, deep yeah, yeah, fine, fine, fine. Okay, thank you, Arman. That was a beautiful discussion. Thank you, uh, Professor Imhoff. Thank you, Professor Martinek, Professor Tadi Mohan, and Dr. Ravi Kerka. Thank you very much for uh, to all of you. Uh, that was a beautiful program. I hope to see all of you again with us together. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas. Thank you very much, and good luck with your COVID. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.